Go on, Nick. On August the 1st, 1994, Sophia gave birth to her first child, a son she called Philomene. For a native Fijian, he had surprisingly dark skin and straight hair, but Sophia put it down to an inheritance from his grandfather. The birth of a light-skinned child on the same day at the same hospital to an ethnic Indian family caused considerable upset. Farida's cane farmer husband accused her of sleeping with a Fijian and treated her cruelly because of it. Of course, it was a hospital mix-up. But now it's been discovered, Farida doesn't want to give up the Fijian boy that she suckled and loves as a son. <laughs> An hour's rough drive away, Philomene's Fijian mother finds herself torn by conflicting emotions. But she'd like to swap the boys back. What's enlightening for an outsider about this remarkable story of mistaken identity is the patience and the tolerance with which the two families, one Fijian and one ethnic Indian, have treated each other during such a difficult time. You see, the race card, tensions between the communities, the question of who owns Fiji, have been used as an excuse and a reason for a coup, for a change in the constitution, and for a government that is anything but democratic. And yet speak to the two mothers, Sophia and Farida, and they'll tell you that the race issue is a nonsense. <laughs> Listen to some of Fiji's politicians and you'll get a very different view of race relations. Iliesa Duvalovo gets treated like a chief when he visits Fijian villages, but he's just a politician. A front-runner for the nationalist movement, his message is that native Fijians are under attack, their culture and land ownership threatened by immigrant Indians who number almost half the population. I'm not stirring up anything. If anything I'm stirring up, I am stirring speaking against injustices, which has been legalized in those places like Australia and New Zealand and, and, and Hawaii. You know, I mean, how can you legalize injustices? It's exactly the same nationalistic justification used by the men who led Fiji's military coup nine years ago. But Duvalovo warns of a new plot to steal Fijian rights. Do you see a conspiracy of Indian leaders to take power from the Fijians? Some of the, yeah, the Indian leaders, there's a conspiracy, but not only confined here, it's a, it's, it's a networking throughout. It could be behind the Indians are the, the superpowers like America, England and Australia could be including. Why would they be behind that? There's a lot of wealth here, even in Naloto, there's gold and marble up on those hills, gold and oil underneath you. There's a lot of wealth, but the thing to take it away from them is to take control of their political, political power first. Do you think perhaps you and uh, the people who support you are just being a bit paranoid about uh, the fears of losing power? It's not paranoid, being paranoid, it's a reality. The reality is the Fijian elite that now rules the country is running it into the ground. National and international investors have fled amidst reports of corruption and mismanagement. Many local Indian businessmen have lost confidence. And to top it off, the government-owned National Bank of Fiji 
has been used as a sort of private piggy bank by the Fijian elite. There is no question that the National Bank of Fiji disaster uh, is a very, very serious event. Peter Stinson, Fiji's ambassador to Australia and former minister for economic planning. Um, I would like to be an optimist and hope that we've learnt from that experience. We cannot uh, just have freedom of, of handing out loans to, to individuals without proper checks and so on, and it's very important that we have the right management uh, in such institutions. But there are those who believe the government's learned nothing, and nor does it want to. We have an extraordinary degree of financial incompetence. Appointment to the boards and the management of these organisations has always been the selection of politically pliable people. Cronyism, nepotism, all its forms. Miles Johnson is a corporate lawyer and third-generation Fijian who stood up against the 1987 coup and today crusades against what many see is a profligate and self-serving elite. I would certainly love to get the bastards because we know who they all are. Mm. And they're trying to assume a, uh, a more respectable sort of guise. They haven't really succeeded. They're all the same. So as far as my views towards those people who locked me up and chased me around the country, occupied my house and did a whole lot of other rather unpleasant things to me, no, my view hasn't changed at all. In fact, everything they've done since confirms what sort of people they are. Johnson convinced us to visit the nearby island of Taveuni to witness the scale of the problem. Now we're going to log timber in the hills up yeah. here, process it here, yeah. and barge it out away from the On that old ship over there? Yeah. A former president of Fiji was part of this failed timber operation. Never a tree was processed, nor the log barge ever launched. And the National Bank of Fiji took a five million dollar bath on the deal. The sorry fact is that at the moment there's virtually no foreign investment in Fiji at all. As for investment in the real sense of the term, bricks and mortar and jobs and industrial development, there's just none. And so the general picture that anyone from outside the country must get is that it's uh, it's badly run, it's shaky, it's in the hands of incompetent people. A few kilometres further south on Taveuni lies one of the nation's biggest white elephants on its own little stretch of tropical paradise. In the mid-70s, the Taveuni estate was planned as a haven. Hundreds of plots for the wealthy, jaded by the Costa del Sol, or for that matter, the Gold Coast. The owner of the estate was none other than the Fijian ambassador to Australia, Peter Stinson, who ended up with a huge outstanding debt to the National Bank. Two years ago, the then Minister for Finance, he got up in Parliament and he said that the Stinson loan was $24 million. Now, that's two years ago. What we were told only weeks ago is that the loan no longer exists. The loan was the single biggest debt on the National Bank's books, and what happened to it has been the subject of intense public speculation. Mr Stinson agreed to talk about it for the first time with foreign correspondent. And he says it was nowhere near the 24 million quoted in Parliament. That, I understand, was a previous Minister of Finance. And having been a parliamentarian myself, often when you're on your feet, your figures are plucked out of the air. But so he got it uh, wrong? 
He got it wrong, yes. There, there's no indication that the debt ever reached that figure. So if the debt didn't reach $23 million, what did it reach? $8,399,088. What happened to it? It was repaid. In fact, what happened was the bank offered Mr. Stinson an amazing deal. First, it set up the former director of the lands department as an independent valuer, then gave him his first job of valuing the estate. The result, a mere 25 plots of undeveloped land, were reportedly valued at, conveniently, $8 million. Yet just 12 months before that, the estate had been advertised around the world, and there was only one bidder for one plot of land, a derisory $5,001. Either you have done an incredibly smart deal, an incredibly clever deal as a businessman, or the bank has made an incredibly stupid decision. I think history will have to decide that. The whole thing's turned into a complete disaster. Um, commercially, it's a disaster. From Fiji's point of view, it's a disaster. Um, what investors from overseas must think about this, I've got no idea, but it just must be awful. So today, the bank is able to say it's cleared a big debt from its books, while Mr Stinson continues to run Tavayuni, also known as the Songulu Estate. I am confident that that estate uh, can be successful in the future. The dreams I had for it in the 70s can still be achieved. It was one of the biggest employers on the island in the 70s and early 80s. It represents probably the largest single private investment on an outer island in Fiji ever. And if Songulu succeeds, the island of Taviuni succeeds as well. If some have prospered since the coup, many more native Fijians have fallen into poverty. <laughs> Economist Father Kevin Barr sees the growth of shanty towns around the capital Suva as the most stark example of increasing problems for indigenous Fijians. Go, go. Five, five. children. And Just then, five children. Uh -huh, but these would be the grandchildren you're looking after now, eh? Ah, oh, right. Uh -huh. So where are the parents? Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> increasing poverty, social collapse, and a rising crime rate. Kevin Barr sees no likelihood of improvement without political change. People feel that, uh, OK, if those higher up can go and take what they want, uh, why not us? And even recently, with the increase in the salaries of our parliamentarians, I've, I actually heard people say that. You know that uh, our potential criminals are going to say, well, they can take what they want, well, why not us? Having failed its people so obviously, the Fijian elite still opposes any change that undermines its control of the country or lets the Indian community share power. But change has to come. Change recommended this year by an independent constitutional review panel headed by a former New Zealand Governor General. Fijians voted for Fijians, Indians voted for Indians. That sort of dynamite because it means that one side is locked into being perpetually within opposition. We're trying to say, let the particular things that are precious to Fijians be taken out of the party political arena, let them be protected constitutionally, then let the political process flow more easily. I, I disagree with it. And uh, we showed this, we manifest this by burning the thing because we disagree with it totally. But whether nationalists like it or not, the Indian community is pivotal in Fiji's future, from the energetic business community to the crucial cane farmers. Always prevented from owning land and today frozen out of the political process, confidence in their adopted country is at a low ebb. Instability filters from the top down to small farmers like Nazir, father of the little Fijian boy swapped at birth. Nazir is a fifth-generation cane farmer. His land rents have doubled. 
His income has halved, and the national bank collapse has caused a credit squeeze. And worse, like thousands of others, his lease may not be renewed because the traditional Fijian landowner is afraid of committing himself in these uncertain times. I think it, it, is, it is very, very essential. I think it is crucial. Uh, if we do not uh, uh, get the constitution fixed and make it acceptable... To... Mahendra Chowdhury is the Indian leader of the multiracial Labour Party. Now, the World Bank, uh, in its uh, report on the economy of Fiji, uh, has pointed to uh, the fact that uh, Fiji cannot expect reasonable rates of economic growth unless it solves these two problems gets a constitution which is largely acceptable to all its people and gets the land lease uh, uh, problems resolved. For some, it goes beyond politics or even revolution. For Miles Johnson, it's a long pursuit of justice that's lost him business, clients, status and friends. I've lost a few friends, but I don't think I'm any worse off. <laughs> And <clears throat> the, the fact is I've made a lot of friends. The, um, <clears throat> the coups have unmasked a lot of people. And I don't think at the end of the day, I've, in terms of friendship, I've lost anything. I mean, financially and so forth, yes, I've lost an enormous amount when they devalued the currency by a half. Bang, there goes half your assets. Um, but, you know, that's all really water under the bridge. <clears throat> um, because it's, it's really had its rewarding qualities too. In the end, the coup has made life worse for most Fijians, no matter what their racial heritage. And without constitutional change, the tensions between Indians and Fijians will seep out into communities that for now live in harmony and seek to resolve even their most perplexing problems.